Welcome to the Political Trenches, local government at work. Today we are back after a longer than anticipated summer hiatus, which almost turned into a fall hiatus. We are back on the road, crisscrossing Canada, speaking with municipal stakeholders and discussing the top municipal stories from across Canada. Today we are heading to the only officially bilingual province in Confederation, the beautiful New Brunswick. But before we break down the stories and chat with today's guest, Ian, it truly has been forever. How are you? It does seem to have been a while. It's funny you say this is the New Brunswick week. I was in New Brunswick about uh, three weeks ago, give or take. So I'm interested to catch up with Dan again and and see what's going on there. It's been a busy summer, uh, busier than we thought it was going to be, which I think is probably good. And we'll get into some of the reasons for that in a little while. So, yes, good to see you, Chris. And it was a little longer than we initially thought it was going to be. It certainly is. But we're back and we're going strong until the end of the year. And then we're going to recap and then break for January and then back in February. But before we do that, we got some big stories that we want to discuss. And our first story comes from Kristen Holiday of Casnet in Kamloops, British Columbia. And the story goes, Kamloops Mayor Reed Hammer Jackson has gone to police over fears his office in City Hall might have been bugged. Behavior called out as, quote, paranoid and delusional, end quote, by one of his city council colleagues. Mounties co- confirmed the complaint was received. They said the investigation is now closed and no charges are being recommended. Hammer Jackson said he became suspicious his office had been bugged after Councillor Bill Sare sent him a short audio clip. A soundbite, the mayor says, is from an argument the two had at City Hall nearly two years ago. The argument happened in January of 2023 and was overheard by some city employees, sparking a third-party investigation. What concluded Hammer Jackson was disrespectful or demeaning to certain staff members. Hammer Jackson said he went to the police after it concerned a criminal offense had taken place. Quote, I filed the file because I'm like, holy man, you know, my office is bug or what? So even though I'm the mayor and the CEO and I'm a peace officer as the mayor, Councillor Sari told me that someone forwarded him that audio, the mayor said. Ian, how should city leaders address concerns of trust and transparency when a mayor publicly accuses council members or staff members of potential surveillance? You know, Kamloops has been in the in the news pretty much since for the last two years since um, this mayor took office. And it's not usually been for something good. It's a bit of a saga that's been going on with Kamloops and we've kind of been keeping an eye on it. So it's uh, it certainly is problematic of course the mayor does have the same recourse any other citizen does if they want to involve some sort of an investigation by uh, connecting by connecting with um, uh, law enforcement authorities so absolutely within his rights to do that the in this case however it seems to be a pattern of behavior from the mayor that pretty much everybody has called out whether it is colleagues on council, whether it is independent third parties who've been asked to take a look, doesn't really matter. Throughout all of this, however, the mayor has seemingly refused to concede that perhaps some of the things that he's been doing ought not to have been done, or the methods by which he's doing things ought not to be, uh, or are not in alignment with the principles of government, uh, good governance. And Candidly, well, I shouldn't even say candidly, truthfully, this may what's happening here may be one of the advantages of the weak mayor system, where we have a mayor who has apparently fallen out of alignment with pretty much everybody else, uh, but doesn't have any additional powers that to other members of city council. Our next story comes from Stephen Brunn from CBC PEI. Somerset Mayor has returned to social media and open to the public office hours after an experience with online harassment that he ultimately had to report to the police. Since his election in November 2022, Dan Kutcher has been more active than many municipal politicians on social media platforms and his open office policy on Friday mornings could be considered unusual among public figures. But he felt that kind of outreach was valuable. Quote, it always looks different and particularly to the individuals and that's okay. I really think that's the this role is to try and make sure that our community is a better place than it would have been if we weren't. Trying to make people's lives better across the board. 
the mayor told CBC News in an interview. Ian, how can local politicians effectively balance public outreach on social media with the risk of online harassment, knowing that you just wrote a book about online harassment and harassment in the municipal sector, particularly in the age of increased digital engagement? You know, this is kind of the opposite to our last story. This is a case where a seemingly well-functioning, well-organized, ethical mayor is being beaten down, figuratively anyway, by people who are out there just trying to make him look bad. Uh, this, I mean, we, as you mentioned, we interviewed Mayor Kutcher not that long ago and had a really good conversation with him. And I'd encourage viewers to go back and have a look if they're interested in seeing what's going on in PEI. However, I mean, we elect elected officials, mayors, reeves, wardens, elected councillors, trustees, whatever the case might be, to represent us between elections. So we believe, I believe, they have to know uh, more about their the municipality than anybody else does. I believe they have to be invested in the municipality. And a big part of that is staying in touch with the people who elected you and others as well. So respectful engagement, I think, is important to all orders of government. The interface between elected officials and the people that they represent. However, the elected officials can only really control their own behavior. So we saw that with the mayor of Kamloops. We're now seeing that with what Mayor Kutcher has said in Summerside as well. And I was actually in Summerside about three weeks ago, too, on a trip to PEI. We've seen some reaction to this uh, moving beyond just the elected officials by saying some places in Canada have begun to create bylaws around this, looking for a respectful treatment of elected officials. Uh, but my suspicion is that things like this will only actually work on those people who are normally civil anyway, and they're typically not the people about the, whom these bylaws are created. Uh, much, If I may, too, much like we talked about with Kamloops, eventually this does become criminal potentially, and then the police get involved. And so it moves out of the realm of kind of the local government thrust and parry and now more into the criminal system as well. So we, we, we've we sort of had an overarching theme on the last few episodes of this show, talking about abuse and talking about harassment in the municipal sector. And our show did a deep dive with two roundtables. You were part of one of them. And we did a roundtable with uh, three female politicians from across Canada. But the one thing I, will, I, I forgot to ask, and I should have asked, who draws the line of when harassment starts and who doesn't? Because... I think that's where a lot of, and I, I'm, I'm trying to play devil's advocate here. And for those who are about to send emails, please don't, because I'm just truly asking a question. Where does the line get drawn of when harassment start and when it's just honest to goodness, wanting answers about what's going on in the community? Uh, it's a really good question. And whether it's harassment or bullying or something like that, the terms often don't have six uh, real or significant definition. Yeah. Particularly the term bullying tends to be somewhat subjective. What's bullying to me may not be bullying to you. So that happens. There are There is a legal line, however, um, where things like uh, defamation begin to happen. And then it's up to the courts to decide whether that's actually happening or not. Uh, but when, it, when we stick to just what good behavior of municipal officials or of the public, that tends to be defined differently in different places. And when it's codified in things like a, like a code of conduct bylaw or a respectful workplace bylaw or uh, a bylaw that has an impact on the public in terms of how they treat uh, elected officials, then you start to codify it. But there isn't something that's unique. Sorry, there isn't something that's universal across the country in terms of what constitutes harassment, what constitutes poor behavior, what constitutes bullying. So it's a it's a really tough thing. And a lot of people have tried to tackle it in terms of trying to define it, uh, trying to understand how it happens, why it happens, how to mitigate it short term and long term. So it is something that is becoming worse. And we're trying to get a bit of a handle on it for sure. In your uh, one of your previous uh, comments, you talked about the role that enforcement and police might have in uh, dealing with these issues. How, what role do you see uh, law enforcement and municipal governments playing in addressing these harassments? Because I, 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 when you said police, the first thing I thought was someone's going to blow their head by saying, oh, that's just the mayor asking the police to investigate something that they don't want to hear. So it's just the heavy hand of government trying to shut dissent within the ranks of the population. 
how do mayors and law enforcement and or I shouldn't say mayors, but council and law enforcement have to navigate this sort of treacherous water that they could find themselves in? It is treacherous and it's treacherous because, again, it's subjective that sometimes I've seen individuals uh, threaten to call the police or actually involve the police in something that's extremely petty. And in other times I have seen uh, police not called in times when perhaps they ought to have been called. I've been part of council meetings where the RCMP has been invited just to kind of keep the peace. And there's also different policing organizations. I made reference to the RCMP and municipal police services, but there's also bylaw officers and sheriffs and things like that as well. So depending on the severity of what's happening, different types of policing may, nece may necessarily be involved. It's not uncommon for a community police officer to be in attendance at a council meeting, particularly if there's some sort of raucous topic or contentious topic. When it comes to life out in the community, it's more likely to be the police service of record that is the one who's going to be more involved. Until people start behaving well, and again, I've made some grace lots of times, until that happens, it's going to be quite difficult to turn this around. We we can't control at the moment the those anonymous keyboard warriors, and they're really hard to track down. There are lots of people out there who are suffering at the moment, and they choose to, some of them choose to blame others for either their ignorance or the plight that they end up in. There are those we've we've been joking around. I mean, Alberta, we've been joking around about contrails, sorry, chemtrails via our provincial government over the last little while. And there are people there who believe that sort of thing. There are our uh, convoy folks for whom the Dunning-Kruger effect is very important. But if there's a really, to me, if we look at this in long term, there's a, it's something very harmful that is if, if behavior doesn't improve. And that's behavior on the elected officials who lead and behavior on the part of those who interact with them from, from the public. And that is, we're going to find good people not running for office, or we're going to have we see lots of elected officials now for whom one term is more than enough, and they're choosing not to re-up. And what that means then is that we're going to distill our councils down, whether it's council or whether it's our legislatures or even parliament, to the pure partisans. And it just becomes a vicious cycle at that point. And we're going to turn to our final topic. It's not a story, but it is something that is imp uh, important to a lot of municipalities across this province. And that is, if you haven't already, you probably had that doorbell ring. And it's not a trick-or-treater. It's candidates in its election season here in Canada. As provincial elections unfold across Canada, the outcomes of these elections will certainly have an impact on the day-to-day -day uh, local governance Ability. Municipal governments, while responsible for the day to day management of cities, towns, and villages like public transit, infrastructure, and water and wastewater, often find themselves heavily influenced by provincial policies and budgets, or if not, determined by those as well. The alignment or lack thereof between newly elected provincial leaders and municipal priorities can either enable or hinder a municipality's ability to address critical issues such as affordable housing, climate resilience, and even public safety. Ian, as provincial elections unfold in BC, as we're recording this, it is happening this Saturday, New Brunswick as this airing, and Saskatchewan a week after this airs, how should municipalities prepare for any potential change in provincial leadership, provincial party changes, or political positions that are announced during provincial elections? Yeah, uh, so elections are fundamental, of course, and we seem to be on typically four-year cycles, five-year cycles, depending on where we are. You can throw into the mix, too, that in some provinces right now, we've got local government elections happening, that Saskatchewan's coming up in the next month or so. Actually, as of recording, Yukon is today, based on when we're recording, and Nova Scotia goes to the polls in a couple of days again, based on when we're recording. So there are going to be some significant differences. There is a role for municipalities to play through the course of the lead up to an election, through the election period, and then following up as well. But I think... For the most part, I think it's actually up to the provincial associations, municipal associations, rather than the individual member, individual municipalities, just because of the lobbying power, the advocacy power, the, the, the work that they can put into developing position papers, that sort of thing. I would suggest, though, if there are positions that municipal or sorry, that provincial associations have taken and that they represent local government across the across the province, they certainly can advocate. Uh, so they can meet with the candidates for their provincial office, their MLA candidates or MPPs or MHAs, whatever they are in the jurisdiction. So individually, they can they can advocate for shared positions. 
It is dangerous, however, for individual local governments to push for change with provincial government just because of the way our Canadian constitution works and therefore the control of local government works as well. We have seen local governments be smacked by uh, respective provinces. And so that uh, has has a, a potential for some fear too. And I expect that local administrators are preparing briefing or have been preparing briefing material for elected officials to use during the campaign or provincial campaigns and material also for what happens afterwards. Kind of the what if scenarios, depending on who ends up, which party ends up forming the government after the election is all wrapped up, because the municipal governments and the municipal associations will have to work with a new minister responsible for municipal affairs, with a new premier potentially as well. So yes, there is a role for local government in elections, but it's more collective, I think, than it is uh, individual. And on the flip side of that, you, you did talk about the municipal elections that are going on right now. Um, I, from an administration standpoint, because this is where you come into the fold, you work with a lot of administrations across the country, along with councils as well. What should administrations be looking at and taking note of when it comes to municipal elections, like you said, Saskatchewan's going to the polls, Yukon, parts of the Northwest Territories are going to the polls, Nova Scotia is going to the polls as well. How should municipal administrations prepare for any change of leadership or council after the election? I think actually it starts before the election a little bit too, and that would be, or immediately after, I mean, they have to, municipal, municipalities have to be very, not only be unbiased, but be seen to be unbiased through the municipal election period. So it's very important, I think, for administrations to stay out of the stay out of the fray. They may be providing information to candidates. And if they're doing that, they're hopefully providing it to all candidates, releasing information publicly so anybody can see it, all of those sorts of things. But immediately following the election, I suspect there are lots of um, municipal managers, CAOs, who are reaching out to the newly elected people, maybe probably even before they've been sworn in just for a, a soft welcome. They may also be approaching retired uh, councillors, whether it's voluntary or not, to look at things like exit interviews for what worked, what didn't, what do we need to change. They've likely already prepared transition material for the, the incoming council major issues that are on happening, large projects that are underway, any advocacy efforts like we just talked about, sort of that sort of thing in terms of briefings for the transition. And then you move more into the formal part of the transition, which is uh, orientations and onboarding. The onboarding being where are the keys, how do you get paid, what are the benefits? And the orientation being kind of what is the job really? How do you, how do you take on this role that you have just been elected to and carry it out to the best of your ability? Where does your job end and administration start? That sort of thing. Um, so they've got to be doing that. Um, they're likely uh, working their way through the election or appointing of a new chief elected official uh, of some sort or another. So they may be working, administration may be working with a new mayor or a new reeve. Um, sometimes they're elected from within. Sometimes they're popularly elected. They'll be starting their regular cycle of meetings, which would have been published before the election, but may have to change depending on who gets elected. And finally, my suspicion is they will be debriefing with their the, their own municipal officials who helped with running the election. What worked? What didn't? What do we need to do differently next time? So just a quick snapshot of how administrations are preparing for uh, for the new can for the new councils to come into place. Yeah. I'd say, too, we're already booked doing I'm off to. Um, Nova Scotia doing a few orientations. We're in Saskatchewan doing a few orientations. And in fact, Alberta doesn't have its elections for a year, just a little under a year now. And we've already booked up quite a few orientations here too. So there's a lot of that that's pre, pre-planned um, in our experience a year or more in advance. Wow, that's that's good to hear. It's good to hear that municipalities are planning for this. Um, we're we will be right back after a quick break with the executive director of the Union of Municipal. Welcome to the Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. Our guest today is Union of Municipalities, New Brunswick Executive Director, Dan Murphy. Dan is a dedicated leader with extensive experience in both government and nonprofit sectors. 
focused on building strong communities. As the executive director of the Union of Municipalities of New Brunswick, he advocates for the priorities of 57 member municipalities. Before this role, Dan held senior positions with federal and provincial ministers and served as executive director of the New Brunswick Nonprofit Housing Association. He also volunteers as treasurer of the Housing Hub of New Brunswick and serves on the New Brunswick College of Pharmacists Public Committee. Dan holds degrees from St. Thomas University and Carleton University, which I will not hold against him as a Queen's University alumni, and resides currently in Fredericton, New Brunswick. With that, Dan, welcome to the Political Trenches. Yeah, thanks, folks. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Dan, I'm going to kick off the line of question with a very important one. In your opinion, as executive director of your organization, what do you see as the state of municipalities in the province of New Brunswick today? Um, I think it's a it's a transitional time still, I think is how I would describe where we're at. There's lots of excitement, lots of challenges. Um, but, uh, you know, state of local government is that we're, we're, we're the ones who are making things happen. Um, and with the right supports and the right, uh, and the right policy changes, we think we can do a heck of a lot more to benefit uh, the province and its citizens. So I'll, I'll jump in now, if that's okay. And well, I, the government of New Brunswick instituted some sweeping changes in municipal structures in New Brunswick, not that long ago. I think they took effect as of the last municipal election. And now that there's been a little bit of time for the dust to settle, how are changes working out? And for those people who don't know, what were some of the changes that happened? Sure. So so the uh, the provincial government here in New Brunswick embarked on a uh, local governance reform process. It's something that our sector has been advocating for for, for many decades to see happen. Um, so we went from about 340 entities down to 77 municipalities plus uh, 12 rural districts. Um, so, you know, some, a lot of, you know, one, two, three, four communities coming together, um, and trying to, to make things work. Um, so it's been, um, it's been a challenging time for a lot of folks, a lot of new counselors, first time I've ever been sitting on a council because they're from areas that never had any, any local governance representation. Um, so in some cases, uh, you know, things are going well. Um, some communities are really starting to build a new identity for their new their new municipality and are coming together uh, collectively. Uh, other communities is taking a little bit more time, which I think is a normal sort of process whenever you're going through some kind of change. So we're um, just there trying to provide support where we can. And, uh, you know, we're, we're gearing up, I guess, for uh, our next round of municipal elections. We're at, a, at the midterm mark now. So 2026 will be... Uh, May 2026 is the next round. So trying to to work towards that too. Uh, there's there's an interesting uh, election that is happening or has already happening, happened depending on when you're listening to this episode in the province of New Brunswick. Uh, with that as a backdrop, you recently, the organization just held their annual fall convention as well. Um, what advocacy platforms and pillars will the organization be focused on heading into the future because you you have a provincial election on the horizon you have uh the uh the, the advocacy work that municipalities need to do over the next two years before the next municipal election what is in the forefront for the union so for us the big priority the biggest priority i would say is the the completion of the municipal reform process so we've 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 done the structural work but we haven't fixed the financial components um, and the structural change that we need for a new fiscal framework in New Brunswick. So I would say that's our that's our top priority. Um, you know, we had a report that we released earlier this fall uh, that we did in partnership with Craig Brett from Mount Allison. Um, you know, pointing out a, a two hundred million dollar annual gap in municipal funding. So that's going to be our first and foremost thing of trying to get uh, that addressed. And it's been what we've been working on throughout the election to get parties to commit to it. And all, all three parties have committed to implementing some level of fiscal reform. Um, we don't quite know what the details of those are yet, but that's going to be for us after the election on, you know, whatever, whatever you watch this, I guess we'll be working on getting, uh, getting that uh, in the hands of whoever the government is to make sure that we continue to make that progress. Do you see the, the timing is actually really interesting for this conversation because we were talking about elections in general, just as, uh, as a topic before we, we, we well, we, we will a little bit later on. And um, do you see 
the role, how do you see the role differing for the association versus the individual municipalities in terms of advocacy efforts, uh, looking collectively versus individually? Yeah, I think what we're trying to do, and, and one of the things we did this year, which is which is new for us, is we, we signed a memorandum of understanding with the Association Association Francophone des Municipalités, um, so our sister organization, um, to advocate collectively as with one voice on fiscal uh, reform. So uh, trying to leave less space to be divided um, and trying to represent the best interests of all municipalities and making sure that we get a get a, an agreement that works for, you know, cities like it works for villages and, and, and towns. So we're trying to, to do that collectively. And I think that um, we need to do it from a central voice with, with the input and support, obviously, of our members helping us push that on the ground, which they've been really good at doing this, uh, this electoral uh, cycle. I want to talk about the broader context of council and administration for a few seconds, if you don't mind. Um, we are seeing, and I say that as the Ian and I, we've been doing this show for almost two years now, we're seeing a change in apathy when it comes to municipal elections and even councils. More and more small rural communities, even councils in general, are being acclaimed. Is the job of council a desirable position in New Brunswick, or are you seeing uh, a change in attitude towards it? Um, that's a, that's the million dollar question, I guess. Um, you know, in some places I'd say there's a lot of interest, um, in other places, not so much. Um, you know, it's becoming increasingly, you know, challenging. And I think, you know, when you look at just the social media world that we live in, that people feel less, um, I guess, shame and remorse to say things that you'd never say to someone in person. And that can make the job really difficult, um, when people are, are being, you know, quite abusive and quite, uh, you know, disrespectful in how they go about it. So, um, you know, if you're a younger person, if you're, you know, someone who wants to do things for certain reasons, like, why would you sign up to get, you know, to get basically, you know, made fun of and ridiculed? So I think we've got some work to do um, in New Brunswick on how we deal with harassment of councils and councillors and mayors. I know other provinces have taken some action on that. I think that's probably going to be something we're going to dig into in the in the year in the year to come um because i think that's one of the things that we would see why people aren't getting involved um is partially is just the you know the the things that the, the negative parts that come along with it and then i don't always think we do a great job of selling the benefits of being on council either um you know i i've as you mentioned in the bio i've worked federal i've worked provincial i've worked, worked municipal now and um no one is getting involved in municipal politics to like to make a living. It's because they want to help their communities grow. They want to support, you know, the places that have supported them. Um, so I think there's a really great message about the difference you can make as a, as a community leader that I think we can do a better job of selling. Well, my obvious to this is you all should read my book, uh, Who's Driving the Greater, about uh, role clarity. It's a shameless plug at the moment. The To, to transition a little bit more broadly, potentially, uh, you have a series of colleagues around Atlantic Canada. Is there much work that happens collectively? <clears throat> Do you learn from one another or work with one another in the Atlantic provinces in the role of municipal associations? Yeah, 100%. Um, we work, um, you know, back before I started, there was an MOU that was signed between uh, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, and Newfoundland. Um, so I get together with my colleagues at NSFM and FPEIM and MNL on a fairly regular basis, and we share best practices and try to work together on, on certain projects. Um, you know, I think back to a, a few years back in the last federal election, we put out sort of a series of Atlantic asks around what we thought we could look at for the federal election. So that's one of the things that we've done in the past, um, you know, certainly looking at how we can support each other going forward. We, we invite each other to each other's conferences. Um, and, you know, we try to get together at least, you know, once every couple months to kind of go through things. Uh, in New Brunswick, again, the AFMNB and UMNB, we work really closely together and often take sort of ideas from each other to implement at our own events mm -hmm. um, and our own work. So, um, and really that's the case nationally, like the the group of PTAs across the country are really supportive of one another. And um, whether you're in Alberta or in Saskatchewan or New Brunswick, we all, we all know we can count on one another, which is kind of part of the fun part of this job is that it is a very collegial um, atmosphere. So it's great. I don't think anybody goes to school to get a degree in how to manage a municipal association of any sort. So what's your path? What? How did you end up here uh, personally as uh, with the association? 
Uh, it's a, it's kind of a funny, kind of a funny story. Um, so I grew up with UMNB, um, not really where I thought I would land. Um, my, my father was a past president of the union. Um, he was executive director for 15 years. Um, so there was a person in between my dad and I in this role. Um, and I, this was not even on my radar until, um, my predecessor encouraged me to apply and, and I, I did and. I've been having a great time since, but um, I grew up around local government, you know, and again, I go back to executive director, president. He was also mayor of my hometown of Brexton. Um, so after school, I used to get my bus dropped me off at the town hall. That's where he picked me up. So like I kind of hung around with the village office staff. Um, so that's where, that's where I kind of got, I got it from. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I ended up. And then with a bunch of nonprofit experience, otherwise it's uh, it's been a great ride. Um, and I really, I really enjoy the work and the people that I get to work with. Before we wrap up, I have one final question. We always look to the future in our last question on the show. So municipalities are all about metrics. It's about putting in place a metric to try to achieve. So for the organization, for you, what's the metric that you're putting in place for the organization? So if we come back and I say, Dan, let's sit down in one year's time, five years time and 10 years time. What are the metrics that you're putting into place to get done in the, that in the, into the future? Sorry. You mean like in terms of like, what are like the overall objectives or terms of how are we going to measure that, the overall objectives for the organization? Um, so I guess the sort of two things, if I had to look in terms of the year um, ahead for us, um, I guess I'll give you one internal and one external sort of objective sort of that we're looking at. Um, obviously, continued progress on fiscal reform. That's kind of the number one advocacy piece. So to see that uh, get completed right now, the, the schedule date is is to be in place for January 1, 2026. Um, so we want to keep the pressure on that. That's the sort of external piece that, you know, if, if we accomplish that, um, in a meaningful way, I think that would be sort of certainly successful for for our sector and for our organization. Um, internally, um, it's it's the governance process for us. So um, we we last year the cities of New Brunswick Association merged into UMNB. Um, so that's necessitated necessitated a lot of changes on our end. So we've got to you know update our governance structure, update our board structure, update how we make decisions and how we represent our members. So. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's an exciting time for the nerds in the room because governance is always fun to look at. Um, but, um, yeah, so that's the other piece. I think, you know, if I could come back here January 1, 2026 and say, Hey, look, we've got this great, you know, new clear decision-making process. Um, you know, we know how our members are engaging in our association. Um, I think that would be, look, I could do both those things. I'd be really, really happy in terms of overarching goals. Dan, from both Ian and myself, we want to thank you so much for taking time out of your business schedule to sit down and do this interview. Oh, thank you, guys. Much appreciated. Our full interview with uh, UMNB Executive Director Dan Murphy will be airing next week, so tune in for that. Ian, uh, we're back, and it seems like we uh, jumped back on the horse and we're riding into the sunset here because that was another great episode of The Political Trenches. Great interview with Dan Murphy from the Union of Municipalities of New Brunswick. How do you think the episode went? Yeah, it is nice to be back on the horse again and get uh, into some of the, the issues that are relevant to local government across this country. And speaking with Dan just now, of course, Something that's running through the back of my mind is where else are we seeing the same things? And a lot of the things that Dan had talked about are really relevant from coast to coast to coast. Local government is local government. There are some nuanced differences, of course, but I think some of the major topics that he was talking about are relevant pretty much everywhere. So we are back and we're getting to the swing of things, but in the next two weeks, what do you have on the agenda? Yeah, well, if you talk to me two weeks from now, I will be in Charlottetown. Uh, so we're, we're working in Charlottetown with City Council for a couple of days. Actually, a governance refresher partway through the term. I think it's a really good idea uh, for them to be doing something like this. And uh, there's some other travel with other folks uh, here at Strategic Steps as well. So quite a lot around there. I heard back from Municipal World quite recently about an update with the uh, Uncivil Society book that you made a reference to at the, at the beginning of the session as well. So that's still chugging through the editing process with Municipal World. 
Um, well, be sure to say hi to my cousin for me. It's always great to connect with Philip Brown, the blood relative, because we found out are we actually do have ancestors in connection. The, oh, God really? bless the Brown name. And for us here at the Cross Border Network, we're going to be doing a live show on October 28th at the in downtown Regina about the Saskatchewan provincial election. We've partnered with SUMA and we're going to be talking to some mayors across the province of Saskatchewan, or I should say candidates to be mayor, but also some incumbent mayors because they're also in their municipal elections as well. So next two weeks is going to be quite busy for you, quite busy for us. And so it's going to be fun to be back in the political trenches in November with you. See you again in a couple of weeks, I guess.